record my computer. Okay, so the newest research on which diet to follow in MS <laughs> or <laughs> what to add to your diet. Uh, so this paper uh, recently was published in um, Journal of Clinical Investigation and it also got an editorial uh, in uh, the New England. So uh, it might be interesting to see what they actually found. Background to understand the paper. So um, as we all know, um, we have B and T cells um, in the adaptive immune system. And among the T cells, there are different um, subtypes. Uh, you have naive T cells, you have effector T cells, um, the ones that are going to kill uh, pathogens. And then you have uh, regulatory T cells that um, keep everything under control and avoid, um, avoid um, disproportionate um, reactions of the immune system to foreign pathogens. And so um, apart from these different categories, so these, these different T cell um, subtypes, they're also, we can, you could also, um, you could stratify them in on many different, um, in many different ways based on the surface mask markers, etc. But the approach from the article is that um, between the, um, the effector T cells and regulatory T cells, there is one big difference in namely um, the way to how they generate energy. And so apparently um, um, the aerobic um, glycolysis is more important in activated T cells, while the B, so fatty acid oxidation is more important in naive T cells. And what has become clear is that um, regulatory, regulatory T cells, T-Rex, that they also uh, use this fatty acid beta oxidation after they are generated. And that this is the more they um, have a sort of metabolic switch toward this fatty acid beta oxidation, the more suppressive they even become. So apparently there is a, there is a correlation between the extent to which they use um, fatty acids, beta oxidation, and the extent to which they are suppressive in their environment. Um, and so um, this metabolic um, difference, they um, so have, is explored in the paper and um, they look at cues um, that, um, that push or the T cells towards this uh, fatty acid fatty acid oxidation, and especially cues in tissue resident T cells. So T cells, T regulatory cells that are present in organs or in, in this, in the case of the paper in adipose tissue, and look which uh, environmental compounds in the adipose tissue could um, cue uh, regulatory T cells to make more use of their um, fatty acid oxidation and just become more suppressive. That's the general background of the paper. Um, and then, so the first, um, so the first part of the paper is centered around normal biology. So how do these? Is, so what is the link between beta oxidation, these suppressive T cell function, and how does it all work? And so and then they um, found, or in general, so very um, simplistically, they found that the most important fatty acid that is present in the adipose tissue. So the longest unsaturated fatty acid, which is oleic acid, apparently is the cue for, um, for um, transcription factors that ultimately lead to more FOXP3 um, suppression expression and thus more suppressive effect of T cells. So oleic acid is a fatty acid present in adipose tissue. And apparently this is one of, this is the fatty acid that is necessary or this DQ for T-Rex to become more suppressive. And that is in normal tissue, in, in people healthy controls and people with MS. So they did a whole range of experiments to um, um, to back this to back this finding. Um, so first, so in the figure one. A. Um, so the first thing they did was they used mass uh, spectro um, spectrometry to um, assess which fatty acid is most abundant in adipose tissue. And so, and then they saw that this oleic acid is indeed the most, the most prevalent one. So then they hypothesized that oleic acid would be the envi environmental cue in adipose tissue for T-Rex to become more suppressive. And that's what they did then in the um, in experience experiments B, C, D, and E, F, G. So in B, they culture T regulatory cells and they culture them together. 
which is oleic acid. And then they look at the oxygen consumption ratio and they see um, to what extent um, the um, um, to what extent the T regulatory cells consume this oxygen. And then you see that so the black squares, um, so the black, yes, that corresponds with the T Rex in uh, on which oleic acid has been added. And you see um, that indeed they induce the highest oxygen. A consumption ratio in T regulatory cells, and then they find that it's different, that there are differences between T regulatory cells and T effector cells, because in T effector cells, which is graph E, they see that um, you see that not the black squares are highest up, but it's this, this arachidonic acid. So apparently in T effector cells, it's a different kind of fatty acid that um, generates, generates the highest, um, the highest, um, um, use of this um, beta oxidation. And so this is, they use these experiments to um, kind of demonstrate that there are metabolic differences between effector T cells and regulatory T cells, um, and that these differences are in, important. Mm -hmm. And then they also, so these are more um, experiments to back this finding up. And then they also looked at the um, at the transcription um, of um, mitochondrial genes, because um, the beta acid, so the fatty acid oxidation needs mitochondrial genes. And then um, they have, so this is in T regulatory cells. And then they found that indeed, when you add oleic acid um, to the, um, um, and oleic acid to T regulatory cells, and then you do um, quantitative PCR, then you see that these uh, mitochondrial genes are upregulated and, especially that um, for the CPT1A and the OTCAT-BL gene, that this can be undone by a etoxomer, which is um, a sort of molecule that um, counteracts um, the fatty acid oxidation. Um, so this was the first experiment to um, back um, their findings. This was the second one. So here they performed suppression assays on um, T effector cells that were co-cultured with T regulatory cells. And um, so this um, histogram has to uh, reflect the suppressive um, efficacy or the suppressive function of regulatory T cells um, on, um, on the effector cells. So the lower the, this histogram or the less surface um, this histogram, the more suppressive effect. Um, and then um, what we see here is that first, so they co-culture effector cells, regulatory cells with nothing, with oleic acid, with arachidonic acid, and with IL-12, which is a sort of negative control. And then you see that when oleic acid is added to this um, mixture, that um, the um, suppressive effect becomes bigger. And um, they do this at different concentration, different ratios of effector cells um, uh, versus T regulatory cells. So the, the, um, um, the more presence of suppressive cells, the more, um, the more suppression effect is seen. And then they also plotted the same. So they plotted these findings in a graph. And here you see, so when with the black squares is, the, is when the oleic acid is added to this mixture, then you see the highest uh, rates of suppression. So the lowest levels of effector cells actually. Mm -hmm. And then they repeated this experiment. Um, I think it's exactly the same experiment in 2C. Um, and then um, they again um, checked whether this, um, this uh, etoxomere could undo this effect uh, on the suppression, um, implying that it would be linked to the beta oxidation. And this was again true. Um, and then they did a third experiment in which they looked um, at gene expression. Um, and so these A, B, and C are all done in, if, in T regulatory cells. And then uh, what can be deducted from these histograms is that when oleic acid is added to, um, um, uh, to the T regulatory cells, and then um, they check for RNA um, transcription, that again, FOXP3 and especially the second exon of FOXP3, I don't know why that's important, and um, the phosphorylation of a set 5 
increases. And when the same the experiment is done for um, T effector cells, we, they don't see this increase in FOXP3 when oleic acid, for example, is added um, to the um, in vitro um, setup, nor for the uh, phosphorylation of STAT5. And then, yeah, so they also did a sort of lockdown, um, knockout, knockdown experiment in which they um, knocked out um, these um, mitochondrial genes um, and then checked um, how this was, um, um, how this affected on um, the, um, on the, um, uh, privately on the uh, on the production of FOXP3. Um, and so this is the CPT1A knockdown. So it means that here, so in the first graph where they plot the, um, the so the expression of CPT1A, that there is obviously no, almost no expression of CPT1A. And then um, you see that when this gene has been knocked out, that's also the expression of FOXP3 is reduced and nothing changes with this third gene. Um, so it's another way of showing for them that um, the beta oxidation is important in the suppressive um, effects of um, the regulatory cells. And then, so the second part of the paper is um, not about is about not about normal biology, but about what could happen in MS. And so this is now so they kind of um, so their findings they now interpret them in the light of an autoimmune disease. And so one, one of the, what they hypothesize is that, um, that there would be less abundant oleic acid in uh, the adipose tissue of people with MS. And that because of this um, lower prevalence or lower concentration of oleic acid, that there would be less stimulation of these transcription factors, less um, and by consequentially less FOXP3 expression and this less suppressive effect of the T cells. And so the big um, drive, the dr what's driving this effect is a, a lack or a shortage of oleic acid in the adipose tissue of people with MS. So that's the, that's what they overall found and the experiments to um, further to demonstrate or to back this are um, the following. So apparently it was very difficult, um, but what they did is the first, ex the first experiment they did, they um, collected the um, T regulatory cells from nine healthy donors um, and you see them here. So it's four females and five males. And then they treated their T regulatory cells with oleic acid and with arachidonic acid. And then they did RNA-seq on, um, on these regulatory cells. And then um, they compared um, the, the, um, the transcription data um, in, these, in, the, in, this, in, the, in, in the regulatory cells with oleic acid and arachidonic acid. But the problem was that apparently there were, um, they looked for individual genes and especially their favorite mitochondrial genes, I assume. But the problem was that there were so much inter, inter individual differences in terms of gene expression that they couldn't, that the, the group was too small to um, draw conclusions upon individual genes. So that's when what I understood is that they um, looked at their entire RNA seq data. And as they had a pair design, they subtracted all the genes that were kind of equally um, expressed in the oleic acid and the arachidonic group, they just, they just didn't take them into account and erasing these inter-individual difference. And they only looked at, at genes that were differentially expressed between these two uh, groups. And then they came up with a combination of 200, 250 genes um, based on thresholds and loading of specific genes. And they put them in a sort of principal component analysis uh, and then um, um, checked which, uh, so which principal components or which combination of these 250 genes explained or gave the biggest differences between the, um, the oleic acid and the arachidonic acid group. So a combination of gene expression that uh, captures the biggest variation between the two groups. And they found a sort of set of genes and this, this is what they call the principal component one. And um, so here you see, so the red dots are the arachidonic acid and the blue dots are the oleic acid. And then you see that based on this, the score 
of these principal components that for all the, na the nine healthy um, healthy controls that were included, that um, the um, oleic acid always has a lower score on the principal component one compared to the arachidonic acid, which always have, has a higher score based on this principal component one algorithm. And so they, uh, this is the sort of, um, this they will use also in their future experiments. Um, so this is healthy control information. And then in the next experiment, which is the same graph, but I put it on a different slide. Yes, so they did another RNA-seq experiment. And they did this experiment now, not in healthy controls anymore, but in people with MS. And they um, collected, so it was single cell RNA-seq in 1,334 T regulatory cells um, and um, from the blood and 805 T regulatory cells from adipose tissue in eight healthy donors and eight patients with MS. And then they, so this is what, what all the remainder of the graphs are about. And then they checked um, to what extent the, um, the, um, the, the T-Rex that, that were collected, hmm, uh, to what extent they, how they scored on this principal components algorithm that they had from the healthy controls. And so they checked gene expression in each individual T cell in plasma and blood and saw which score they had it based on this previous algorithm. And then you have this graph. So this is principal component one and a lower score course, uh, corresponds with more oleic acid profile and a higher score corresponds with more arachidonic acid profile. And then you see here, for example, these are healthy controls, the first line. Then you see that in, for example, blood of healthy controls, that there is a significant amount of T regulatory cells with a blue profile, so oleic acid, and a significant amount with red profile. And when you go down to MS patients that were not treated and MS patients that were previously treated, you see that this blue cluster actually disappears partially. Hmm? That's, so the red, which corresponds to arachidonic acid, uh, as, a, um, um, as, um, a dry, uh, as a, the most, um, yeah, as the metabolic changes um, linked to arachidonic acid are most prevalent. And they do the same exercise in fat. So in these tissue resident, resident regulatory um, T, tissue resident regulatory T cells. And then you again see that there is a blue cluster in healthy controls that becomes at least less prominent in people with MS and people with MS that were previously treated. And they these are all other experiments to show essentially the same. So this in D, uh, you see that so blue are, is this score, this metabolic score based on the principal component analysis in healthy controls, people with MS not previously treated and people with MS previously treated, blood and fat. And then you see again that there is always a low, lower score in healthy controls, implying more oleic acid metabolic profile. And then uh, there was also in figure E, e they showed that there was a, a sex, sex difference between in these analysis that um, female patients consistently had, um, well, in MS at least, lower scores than uh, male patients. In figure F, they checked um, about gene expression. Um, gene, so genes, gene expression in um, um, healthy controls and MS, MS patients. And then apparently, so the um, genes that were linked, so blue is an, again, this oleic acid uh, were higher. So the genes linked to that oleic acid were upregulated more prominently uh, in healthy controls than in people with MS. And G, I think is another way to show the same. So they did then, um, so they did RNA-seq experiments to show the metabolic signature of um, oleic acid-driven um, mm, driven energy um, generation versus arachidonic driven energy consumption. And they see that there are differences between people with MS, healthy controls, and um, that is then also the hypothesis for the next slide. So they hypothesized then that um, by supplementing 
this oleic acid to um, people with, yeah, to their T-Rex cells, not really people with MS, um, that they could undo this lack of suppressive capacity and that they could um, shift T cells towards T regulatory cells towards a more, an even more regulatory phenotype. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so they do the following two experiments to, um, to, um, um, objectifier to prove their points. And so this experiment is again a co call. So T, the same experiment as before. So they did, they co cultured effector T cells with regulatory T cells at different um, co culture ratios. And they looked um, whether um, they looked at the suppressive effect that T, T Rex had on T effector cells. And so the lower the histogram, the more suppressive effects. And so in healthy controls, what they see is that whenever oleic acid is added to this mixture, the suppressive effect increases. And this is not true for arachidonic acid. And um, it's less pronounced in people with MS. So in MS controls, you see that the suppressive effect would, is already higher at the outset. And then when oleic acid is added, it decreases, so it, be, it becomes more prominent, more suppressive effect, but higher levels than in healthy disease, um, and um, not the same effect with arachidonic acid. And then they plotted this. This shows the same as this graph here. And then they did a second experiment um, in which they also looked at immunological phenotypes um, so the change in, 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 uh, in surface markers of immune cells um, after oleic acid or arachidonic acid was added to the co-culture mixture. And then they see that when oleic acid is added to, uh, a co so to um, this, these mixtures of T-Rex, that um, you see, an, um, so you see uh, more, so you see less interferon gamma I'm correct, yes, um, so which is good. And you see more IL-10 positive cells, which are regulatory suppressive cells. So um, they also did so flow facts analysis to for a little bit more functional work um, to back this oleic acid versus arachidonic acid hypothesis. And then um, these experiments have to show again that um, it's all linked to beta oxidation. And when you undo or when you, um, when you suppress beta oxidation, that none of these effects can be visualized. Um, and then in the, the last experiment, which is actually a very important in, in experiment for their findings, they looked at the supernatant of um, adipose tissue um, in people with MS and healthy um, healthy controls. And then they looked at the prevalence of the different uh, fatty acids. And then what they found was that when people with MS are compared to healthy controls, that um, the, you see it here, that oleic acid is apparently more abundant in plasma uh, in people with MS. Yes. So that's the, um, the black dots and the white, do, the, so the black circles versus the white circles above oleic acid, and this is significant. And then, but in adipose tissue, you see that, um, so the healthy, so this is healthy disease, this is MS, and that oleic acid is much more prevalent in, um, in the adipose tissue of healthy people compared with uh, people with MS. The only, um, apparently the problem is that they used for this analysis, they also ch had um, some demographic differences between um, the um, healthy controls and the people with MS. So apparently the people with MS were, had a higher BMI, were a little bit older um, than the people included in the healthy control group. And so um, this is their summary abstract. And indeed the conclusion is very simple. So what they posit is that you have healthy adipose tissue. In healthy adipose tissue, there is sufficient oleic acids and um, when there is sufficient oleic acid, your T-Rex are going to use beta oxidation and become more suppressive. And in diseased adipose tissue, eh, there is not sufficient oleic acid. And then um, there is not a sufficient Q for the beta oxidation. So your T regulatory cells cannot be, uh, then they cannot exploit their full regulatory potential. And the last experiments then show that by in vitro, not in vivo, supplementing um, oleic acids, mm -hmm, that you can 
partially undo this shortage so that you can stimulate the um, regulatory cells to become more suppressive. So that's in um, brief um, the paper. So I think, yeah, so first of all, I was like, when I read it, it's like, what does adipose tissue T-Rex have to do with a mess? So I didn't really entirely capture the underlying hypothesis um, of looking at resident T-Rex in adipose tissue and why MS would be the most logical disease to explore this in. So the, indeed, the only thing that I can think of is that indeed um, childhood obesity is linked to susceptibility of MS later on, but to what extent that we have to look for a defect in regulatory T-Rex in adipose tissue, I, I didn't immediately see the, see the big pathophysiological link, um, why this would be the, yeah, yeah, would be- I, I don't know about T-Rex, but I mean, the, there's some epidemiology pointing to dietary differences in shellfish fatty acids, isn't there? I don't, I don't know if oleic acid comes out from that. I don't remember it coming out strongly. No, but yeah, you know, it's still, yeah, I found it a far, far-fetched a little bit to go and look at T-Rex in adipose tissue, but anyway. And then, um, so, yeah, so ov obviously how important are these T-Rex, but that's the same question in MS pathophysiology, because yeah, it's not like any of our current therapies probably eradicates them. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, um, it's totally unclear to me to what extent tissue res resident T-Rex drive MS pathophysiology. And then what I especially don't understand is how this would lead to treatments or to a useful diet, because what I also don't understand, so maybe if, if the plasma, if the plasma oleic acid is increased, it's probably not because they don't ingest sufficient amount of oleic acids. It's just because it doesn't reach the adipose tissue. tissue. So just supplementing, even if this would be correct, would probably not be sufficient. Um, so, but on, yeah, I assume yeah, if you want to explain this, then there must be some sort of genetic differences. Why this oleic acid doesn't reach the adipose tissue, I assume, but it sounds a little bit, yeah, yeah, maybe that would partially explain why um, the the lower oleic acid levels. But yeah, I I don't see an immediate treatment option um, in. I don't think that there is any evidence that people with MS would eat different or ingest different amounts of oleic acid compared to peers. But yeah. yeah. And so I also found this <laughs> when Googling oleic acid. So apparently this is not the first article um, to look at the beauty effects of oleic acid. Apparently in the vegan world, um, oleic acid is um, high profile and is one of the oils that is commonly, adv commonly advised to, um, I don't know, um, <laughs> to use on your salads. So um, voila. So this is or my reflections, but I guess you all have many more. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I guess my biggest problem or the biggest thing that I don't understand is how regulatory tissue resident T cells would be that important in MS. But yeah, I don't know either. You don't, I don't know what those <laughs> fatty T rigs do. <laughs> um, ben, have you got any idea about how you would get because? I mean, this is really a basic science project. Being, um, it's basically taking T. regs from tissue um, and looking at the biology of T. regs at a single cell level using a uh, new technology. Um, I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how it's relevant to MS, to be honest with you. But uh, David, can you study this in animals? You're muted, muted. David. Uh, yeah, no, I had a quick look. It has been done. So if you feed um, mice oleic acid at 300 milligrams a kilogram, um, it's immunosuppressive. Um, but I, 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 I kind of um, obviously asked the question, is there any evidence that uh, oleic acid um, has an effect on MS? And um, but there have been studies where they've um, fed people corn oil which has got 33% um, oleic acid and it didn't work. Um, then the other question I had was when I looked at Wikipedia, because obviously that's the best site. Yeah, absolutely. It said um, 
the olive oil is a tri a triglyceride, and if it's it's not, it makes it um, inedible. So, is it really when 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 um, you know um, you know olive oil contains a lot of it? It, it seems it's in the triglyceride form as opposed to the non-triglyceride form. I, I mean, I don't know. Because, I mean, it's, it's an obvious question. You say, well, um, you know, it's, it's, is it the answer to the Mediterranean diet? And um... Well, I mean, this is going to lead to the Mediterranean diet being put forward as an anti-inflammatory therapy in MS, David. So I know. And I, I can see the trials right now. That's that, that, that's why my my blog post. I did a blog post on this called um, "Let's Try the New England Diet." Is it, did we do, do it go out today? No, I I, I, I actually I, I actually contacted Ida just uh, before the meeting because I thought this this thing was about this uh, vaccine thing. Yeah. And and so when she said JC, it's like Journal Club. I went, oh shit. And then so I said I, I'd kind of delay what I'd kind of done because I ah. I, kinda, I saw that I saw the article in. Um, New England Journal, but I yeah. couldn't kind of get it initially. So when you sent it, and then obviously I saw the pictures, and I went backwards, and I thought, oh, it's 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 uh it's it's just tailor made for a uh, an oleic acid uh, trial. So so Ben, coming to it from a genomics perspective, is there any way you can get to this from a Mendelian randomization? Is there any biology around the metabolism of oleic acid or its receptor? Yeah. I've got is, all, all, yep. Mm. Oh yeah, no, you you finished what you were saying. No, is any, I mean, I know all these fatty acids have their specific receptors that they bind to. Is there something special about the loic acid receptor that you can, is there polymorphisms in it or anything like that? It's really difficult. So I, so I had a look and I think it's the Annette Langould stuff that suggested that linoleic acids was much lower in people with MS diets. That's all the shellfish stuff. And, and some of it's come out of Sweden as well. So, so I had a look and the MR is very, very difficult because all of the loci that govern fatty acid serum levels are incredibly pleiotropic and a lot of them are MS risk loci as well but it's, it's basically impossible to disentangle because they influence so many traits they're like other than the MA, MHC they're like amongst the most pleiotropic loci in the whole genome so they influence like all your sex hormones and childhood obesity and basically everything downstream of that it's very difficult it's very difficult and that's what makes me suspicious about the epidemiology I'm sure it's just it's mm. downstream of these very pleiotropic loci that are also immunomodulatory. And, the, and that's the other thing with isolating one of these fatty acids is that they are, so the metabolism of all of them is incredibly interconnected and they all compete for the same uh, elongases and enzymes. So yeah. studying one in isolation makes no sense because lower levels of one will lead to compensatory increases in, in all the others. So it's, it's a very artificially simplified system. And like you, Ida, I, I didn't really understand what was their rationale for zoning in on this mm. one fatty acid and this one cell type. Yeah, but, but yeah, no, that's, but that I think for me is the biggest, the biggest puzzle. Why fatty acids in adipose tissue in MS? Yeah, so I mean, that's probably because they have another study going on. That maybe, you know, who knows what they were doing with fat. Well, they tried, they tried them all and this was the only one that worked. It didn't work that well. I mean, David, what do you think of these uh, these facts plots? Uh, absolutely comical. Uh, yeah. I thought it's true. Well, I mean, it is. It's, it depends where you want to draw that line, isn't it? You know, that's always always a problem here. Is that uh, some of it? You go, well, actually, they've drawn it a bit too too far one way, and of course, then there's the bottom cut out of, of some of them. That, like, that is not a biological distinction, is it? However you draw that line, there's no hard and fast biological line there. No, no, I, I would push it. I would actually, if I, I was really looking at it, I would put the, the lines over to the right a bit because they, they look like they're from that one population, don't they? Mm. It's, um, but that's, that's facts for you. Um, now, so, um, so, so you, I, I know you, I know either you said on the graph, because I, I haven't read the paper myself, I'm sorry, I don't have time. But you said that people gamma expression was affected by oleic acid, eh? oh, yes? Yeah. Here, now, that's that's a, based on this, huh? Yeah, so that's actually uh, controlled by redox signaling. So redox signaling of the cell, so um, affects that. So I'm wondering if uh, oleic acid just affects the redox status of the cell. I think it's interferon gamma, uh, gamma not, not PPR, unless I'm, I'm misread. So it's interferon gamma. I'm sure it affects PPR gamma as well, because that's very... 
Have you showed me in the beginning of a picture with people, PPL gamma being affected by this? Go uh, right to yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's here. It's in the yeah, yeah. Absolutely, that's in the. Uh, but I guess it was in the supplementary data, but um, it was it's it's also in this then. here people. Yeah, I think this is something that they did in the supplementary, but I, yeah. yeah so people, 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 gamma, this is alpha, beta, and gamma are redox yeah. sensitive. So um, I could, I, so a lot of drugs, just dimethyl fumarate, DMF. Mm. Yeah. Affects people gamma signaling. You know what I mean. Do you, uh, do you see more MS in the pyoglitazone? Maybe we should do that if we got the got the drug data. We oh, we never, never we never got that funded though, did you? No, we wanted to get a, we wanted to get a study of um, pyoglitazone in MS. But maybe this will make it worse. Because if um, if a layer gas, wait, which way around is it? No, it should make it, it should make it better. Should make it better. Should make it better. Yeah. Yeah. Should make it better. Because it's always oh, inhib inhibitor, isn't it? Yeah. So David, I I, I mean I just come I'm I'm so glad it is at the same problem. I just can't make um I can't get a good narrative to this story. Yeah. Well, I, th I think the, the the problem is is what they do is it's like this science. You just you mentioned T regs and everybody go yay, and 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 it's like when you start to pick it apart, you're going. So how are you going to manipulate diets? I think giving people a lake acid, you're just going to make them fat by giving them excess of oil. It has been done in like, it's particularly in diabetic stuff. And as Ben says, it's like mm. they're all in connected, interconnected. So once you start doing one, they all start going up. Yeah, right. because actually what, if ben, if what Ben says is correct, then it would mean that if you increase oleic acid, um, then you, you reduce all the... So then... Um, that's probably what they want. So it'd be quite interesting to know what, it, what, is, what was the glucose concentration in those in the cell culture? Did they manipulate glucose in the cell cultures? You know? No, glucose. I didn't read any. No, because they added arachidonic acid and they added yeah. um, and they added um, Wait, arachidonic sorry. acid, and they were driving they were driving beta oxidation pathways. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's like a little switch in the cells between glucose and beta oxidation. They're kind of complementary. They, they're kind of antagonistic towards each other. So it'll be quite, I want, I'd be interested to know what um, glucose concentration they had in their cell culture medium. You know, was mm -hmm. it, I guarantee you, uh, it's quite artificial to be honest with you, because I bet, I bet you the glucose levels were dropping in the cell culture medium as these cells were being cultured. And they were driving beta oxidation because there was a, there was a reduction in glucose levels. And even if you buy the model, there's no, it's not really any functional work at all. So they show proliferation and they mm -hmm. show interferon gamma, but there's no attempt to look at yeah. other cytokines and there's no attempt to look at, um, I don't know, I'm going to embarrass myself. I don't know much about how you show T cell responses in vitro, but there's no, there's no attempt to do any of that. No, but also what would be the consequence of less T-Rex suppression in adipose tissue for MS, what would be the consequence of that? Well, I, I, I think it's a plate of example. The, the hypothesis would be, so childhood obesity is very strongly associated. Why is that? Well, we know it's very inflammatory. There's lots of necrosis that goes on. There's lots of release of damps. And the hypothesis would be that maybe if you have lots of adipose tissue during adolescence, then you're presenting self antigens and you accidentally recognize self and you, and you mount a, an anti-myelin response. And but so then, maybe if you've got effective... But is, is less suppressive effect of T-Rex linked to more adipose tissue? I don't know, that... as in, as in maybe the hypothesis would be that if you have sufficient T-Reg activity going on in your adipose tissue, then you don't mount that self-response. Which I, I think is, is plausible on its own terms. I don't, I don't know if there's any... So you think that... that um, more suppression of inflammation in adipose tissue leads to being more slim. Le uh, leads to MS. So I'm saying if you've got lots of inflammation, you've got lots of adipose tissue, that leads to lots of inflammation. Inflammation leads to lots of release of self epitopes. And then maybe that, uh, that triggers more inflammation, more epitopes. Like... Yeah. I think that's plausible, but I, d I don't know if there's any evidence to suggest that. True. Yeah. yeah. Also, which which um, adipose tissue was it harvested from? Was it like the um, uh, abdominal fat, or was it? Related? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, it's probably in the methods, but I didn't read it. 
because there's different um, biology between um, uh, yeah, abdominal yeah. fat. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I really struggle with the uh, PC stuff. I really, um, yeah. I might be missing oh. something huge, but my understanding from that figure is that they've demonstrated that principal components explain some of the variance in the data. That, that's what yeah. PCs are. I mean, <laughs> I, I really didn't get this at all. No, I but I think it's it this to. This is actually the same as that. Huh? So I, I think indeed you are right. So first they do a principal component on healthy controls and then re repeat the, the principal component on healthy controls. But I guess mm. what the, 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 the information they get from it is just a difference with, that it's different in people with MS. Mm. But they don't really attempt to show that in a kind of sophisticated way. So you, you can do quite nice things. I mean, you could you could try and do automated clustering. So you could, if you think that there's some broad scale variation that's going on in your transcriptome when you introduce a lactic acid, then these things, MS patients who are untreated and controlled should automatically cluster. They don't, they don't really attempt to try that. They just say, look, PCs look different. Well, no shit. They're demographically different. There's two or three people in each group. No, the, these are, so this is eight and nine people. Eh? I don't know. I'm being silly, but I, I was very unimpressed by this figure and the conclusions that were drawn. From this. Yeah, it's, it's always the problem with this RNA-seq that it's not very transparent, you know? So it's not like an expert, it's, it's, it's more, it's analytics. Yeah. So oh, it, could be, it could be transparent. I don't know, have they released their data? I mean, it can be very transparent yeah, if you I'm release sure. all of your data in your tools. I'm sure they should have done, they will have done. Um, they, it, mm -hmm. just, it just says adipose tissue. It doesn't say where it's from in the methods. I oh, am. Yeah. Uh, I think if it's that obvious and it's that stark an effect as well, you'd expect to see some differentiated the, the, the genes. Data, the data is available, GOSE 152543. Okay, should we get it? <laughs> yeah, we'll you can get the data and play with it if you want. So what? I, so I mean, the problem is, is this. I know that the spinal is what's going to happen. This is going to get into the. It's going to be in the press. It's going to be on television. It's going to be everywhere, which it really is. And uh, people are going to now start consuming olive oil as a treatment for MS. Yeah, yeah. that's always a story. Yeah, and the, the amazing thing is, it, it got that editorial uh -huh. in um, New England Journal. Well, same with the same with the other paper, David, as well. I mean, um, the Roland Martin paper got an editorial in the in NJM as well. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a club. But Ben, can you um, say to me, um, of repeat for me, what is all known about this childhood obesity? So I totally understood your point, but how strong is all that evidence, and what what do we think is the mechanism underlying that association? Uh, ben and I disagree on this. Ben thinks it's due to inflammation in the in the fat. Oh yeah, it's it's, also, think, do with T, it's also to do with T regs in the adipose tissue. <laughs> and what do you think, Gavin? I think it's got to do with uh, what goes in the mouth, the diet. And you think that? Um, I think I think you think I, it's I, because of the sugar, probably. Yeah, I think that what's happening is um, uh, there's a metabolic switch people people who are fat are consuming too much processed and ultra processed carbohydrates they have 24 hour insulin elevated insulin levels which change the biology of the immune system um it's yeah. pro-inflammatory pro -inflammatory from a metabolic perspective got, i'm not sure the fat is where it happens it may happen in the fat but ben is right there is really good data that people that are fat have got slightly raised CRPs. They've got slightly raised yeah, yeah, ILH. That's true. That's true. They they've they've got a pro-inflammatory phenotype, and whether it's the fat that's doing it or their diets, it's a moot point. Some people argue it's their microbiome that's doing it. Yeah, so, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, but anyway, all we know is that childhood obesity is pretty good, mm -hmm. and also it's if you look at the uh, there's been two or three now. Um, then is it two or three? Um, um, Mendelian randomization studies, yeah, and the SNPs that dictate obesity uh, are in the causal pathway for it. Well, they they also predict MS risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I, 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 I always uh, the thing about Mendelian randomization, the fact that the SNPs are independent predictors of MS risk, 
those slips are only relevant in the in the presence of the environment. You know what I mean? So it still could be the environment that does it. It doesn't mean the slips are because those people are likely to be obese. Yeah. So, but yeah. this is why this is why I always find when yeah. people when people, are, when people are brought into Mendelian randomization, they say, well, because the Mendelian randomization also predicts MS risk, it has to be the flipping um, the causal pathway. No, you still need the environmental exposure to get the disease. Well, convince me yeah. wrong. Convince me yeah, otherwise. Yeah, but that, that's the point. I mean, the the point of the the MR is to show that it is. <laughs> It's the childhood obesity that is a yes. causal risk factor. You're no. just interested in the SNPs as an instrument. As an instrument, yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, so I think it, uh, the, I think the the data for childhood and adolescent obesity is pretty firm from an epidemiological perspective. Mm. And are there? Uh, uh, it should be possible but, to do a study with people who have bad diets but are thin. Is that is that data there? Because that would be the key thing to test your suggestion, Kevin. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, how would you, you know, we'd have to look, um, I think actually, you, if, you, if you look at um, Emmanuel Waban's study, she has done diet. And I, yeah. I do think, I do think that um, she came to it from a uh, junk food perspective, not necessarily carbohydrates. I'll, I'll dig it up. Her publication is in the Annals of Neurology, I think. Yeah, I, th I think I have read it. Yeah. It's just complicated. And the thing is, I think with the diet stuff, you're right, it's so hard to get at because yeah. almost all of this stuff, it's either questionnaires, which are rubbish, where it's mm. impossible to self-report, or it's recall stuff, which is even worse. I, it's very hard to do properly. Yeah, so, I mean, the hard readout. Yeah, but I mean, ever since we've started processing food and eating uh, processed carbohydrates, there's been a massive increase in... Um, uh, autoimmune diseases, not only MMS, Crohn's mm -hmm. disease, type 1 diabetes, RA. Now, the question is, is it just, it's just an association. I mean, who knows what, what, the, what the causal link is? I'm not sure there's a causal link. We've got cleaner as well in that same time. Exactly. Maybe it's cleaner. I mean, there's so many things linked to ch ch changing diet. Mm -hmm. Antibiotics um, came around. Our MHC alleles have changed. So, but... Can I just ask, don't you all think it's a little bit strange that the concentration of this oleic acid was so high in plasma and not in the... So, because that is against a sort of nutritional diet effect, no? Mm. Or, am I, or am I over-interpreting it? Well, I mean, so, so, so oleic acid doesn't... I mean, we're just assuming oleic acid is a marker of a good diet. Are we assuming that? I'm not sure it is. No, but no, but the thing is, if the entire so um, because what they hypothesize is that you can influence it by diet, because that's the entire point of the the last set of experiments. Mm. Mm. The entire point is that you that there would be a sort of lack or deficiency in MS adipose tissue, and that you can supplement it. So, yes, but I mean, so is a like the question? I'm, I don't know this. Yeah. Is it like is the levels of oleic acid in your in your blood proportional to the intake, and is it and is it a marker of a healthy diet? Mm. Um, and even if it is, presumably these effects, like presumably if if they're right, and it is just kind of forming part of the milieu in which the T-regs are working, then presumably that's a real micro environment effect. So it doesn't really matter what your plasma yeah. concentration no. is; it's a tiny, tiny pocket that's relevant. No, but it's also probably not, ma does not matter what you eat, no? Because probably you will yeah. have more than enough anyway to to get it in the adipose tissue, no? Yeah, I don't know how stable the, le stable the levels are over time. Like, I mean, your triglycerides go up and down during a day with meals, and presumably these these fats are all quite similar. But so this is I, what I they directly suggest in the paper, because you see here, olive oil, sunflower seeds, avocado, you know, so this is, I, this is from the editorial, but this is what directly is suggested by the paper that you could influence this by diet. Yeah. So, uh, 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 sorry, a lake acid is uh, a C18, is that right? Um, I don't know. Pass, pass. Yes, it's C18. Okay. But actually, we think, based on what they presented, there is not even the slightest clue that what you ingest would be correlated to the adipose concentration of oleic acid. That's what we just said, no? Or did I capture? That's what that was what we discussed. Yeah. 
or am I getting it wrong? Sorry, I'm just constant. I'm just trying to see if a loic acid circulates. It probably circulates as a triglyceride, surely. Yeah, it'll be. T it'll be. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I, it's a not not a scientific point. I also always find it slightly uncomfortable when they make big claims for like mm. incredibly expensive foods. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all of these foods are incredibly expensive. <laughs> so I just feel I. You know, this is very, very weak data, and I think it would be bad if people with MS felt that they had to go and spend loads of money on foods which really have no evidence for working. No, I told you, yeah, buy apples instead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gavin doesn't like apples. Okay? Yeah, I don't eat apples. Fructose, much, a lot of fructose. Too much fructose in them. And they've also changed. They've actually bred apples to be just a sugar machine. Um you know, a, a lake acid doesn't really circulate as a free fatty acid. It actually circulates as a triglyceride. I am. Um, um, so, I mean, there, I mean, there may be small amounts that are free, but I, it'll be interesting to know. I think I need to review a fatty acid metabolism. I haven't looked at it. I mean, I did it in med school. I mean, that's how long ago I did fatty acid metabolism. Mm. It's a long time. It's very complicated. I wrote, I wrote a draft thing of this linoleic acid thing like a year ago and it was just too complicated to finish and it was just messy and... you should have invited adina Fat... she'd have been uh she loves fatty acids who's adina titus michael yeah. michael titus awesome. titus michael yeah she i mean you're a neuroscientist at uh, the blizzard mm -hmm. she's been working on omega-3 Fatty acids for a hundred years, I think. So, Ida, I want you to do me a favor. Why don't you review? Um, why don't you review aloic acid metabolism in the body, independent mm -hmm. of this? How much? How much is? How much are peripheral levels affected by diet? Does it circulate free, or is it always in triglycerides? That kind of stuff. Because I don't know what the. I don't know what the. I don't know how relevant this is to man or beast. But anyway. That's it. That's your homework, Ida. Yeah. Mohammed. Uh, I don't Mohammed, even know where to start. Mohammed, what do you know about oleic acid? Tell us. Um, absolutely. <laughs> wow, it's embarrassing, but no, nothing really. Just it's the most abundant one in um, in our body, in our adipose tissues. That's what I used to hear before this one. That's why I'm I was interested to come and see what's going on. So. But, yeah, so, uh, so, I mean, I mean, to be honest with you, all I, all I know is, and, and this is going back to Dina, who's our, he's a neuroscientist in our group in the Blizzard, yeah. Mm. And they all got, they've all got their own set of receptors, and they all, they all, I think they all signal by G protein coupled receptors. They affect lots of signaling pathways. It's com it's very complicated biology. This, I think, I, know, I need to know more about it. No, they not have nuclear receptors as well. Like fancy acid binding proteins. They also got they, they, they also got surface receptors, Ben. So why why do they not diffuse in? Are they too? Is it because they're neg are they negative? Are they the anions in circulation? Is it like oleate? I don't know, David. You worked on Borage. Did you work on Borage? Or was it was it Sandra? Sandra, Sandra. She she put on about five kilos while she was doing it. Okay. Yeah. And how does how does borage oil work? That works by uh... first question is borage oil doesn't work. <laughs> 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 they did all these studies and I don't think they found found much. But um... okay, and okay. um, the next journal club is a is a tutorial on on fatty acid so fatty acid metabolism in the human body. Uh, yeah, I mean you, uh, you should do li lipoic acid. That's going to be obviously uh, more in the news, isn't it? Well, is that why also? no because it's basically um what the um the ms society have done a, a search uh. for treatments for progressive ms and like lipo lipoic acid was the number one hit oh really you know, the, the biology behind lipoic acid is very interesting